Good morning students. Today we continue with the margin path and the most important margin path of those times that we have seen in our previous videos was Magad. Um, so let us uh, now start with uh, the uh, uh, with the topic an early empire which is essentially about the Mauryan empire. Um, so the growth of Magad culminated in the emergence of the Mauryan empire. Chandragupta Maurya who founded the empire in 321 years uh, before Christ extended control as far northwest as Afghanistan and Balochistan and his grands grandson Ashoka arguably the most famous ruler of early India conquered Kalinga that is present-day coastal Orissa. We have seen uh, in the previous uh, times uh, the video that yes at that point in time, uh, Magad was very fortunate to have some very, very ambitious and uh, illustrious rulers in the name of uh, uh, Bimbisara, then Ajat Shatru, then Mahapadmananda, who started the, uh, who laid the foundation of uh, Nanda dynasty, he was also very uh, ambitious and a ruthless ruler, and uh, he also expanded it and uh, did not allow any territory to be taken away or to did not allow the gains that were made by his uh, predecessors uh, like uh, Bimbisara and Ajat Shatru to go waste and he actually built up on that and then um, the rot actually started happening around um, you know the son of Mahapadmananda that is Dhanananda and he was kind of more into uh, the uh, lavish uh, life and uh, um, uh, you know wasting the resources so he was uh, quite unpopular and uh, it was because the situation was ripe so Chandragupta Maurya actually ascended the throne of um, uh, Patliputra that is uh, Magad. Uh, but I would just like you to uh, see this box languages and script and uh, this is again uh, which we started right in the uh, beginning of the chapter most most Ashokan inscriptions were in the Prakrit language and uh, while uh, those in the northwest of the subcontinent were in Aramaic and Greek, that is, we had uh, talk, talked about the origins of uh, uh, Kharosthi and <coughs> Brahmi script. Uh, most Prakrit inscriptions were written in the Brahmi script. However, some in the northwest were also written in Kharosthi. The Aramaic and the Greek scripts were used for inscriptions in Afghanistan. Okay, now. Uh, finding out about the Mauryans, students. Uh, uh, one thing needs to be understood that in in in, in historical times, uh, today everything gets documented. Uh, you have a whole international media to document even the tr most trivial and insignificant of events. So nothing escapes uh, international media. And uh, today we have smartphones. All of us have it, and so naturally we are. Uh, uh, we every one of us is playing some kind of a role in the documentation of uh, uh, our present, which one day would become past, and uh, and in and as the time uh, passes, one day would also become history. But in those times, uh, everything had to be documented. Okay, now the, the human tendency, the way it was that every ruler wanted nice to, things to be written by him so uh, uh, and, uh, and written about him. Okay, so they used to ensure that uh, everything that was being documented were, went in their favor. That uh, that how great they were and how prosperous their kingdom was and then there was, uh, you know, a huge amount of crop and it was always prosperity everyone was happy there were large temples and there were huge granaries and then everyone lived in lavish houses all of that and all of that okay and then they had uh, many many victories in battlefields and no king could stand to their army so everything that they would wished and desire they could ask their <clears throat> their respective historians to write and to portray a great image about themselves but then historical for the sense of historical accuracy it was always always whether whether you talk about uh, the Mauryans, whether you talk about the Nandas, you talk about the Mongols, you talk about uh, um, the rulers of uh, the ancient Mesopotamia, it was always 
the Chinese, you, it was always that people used to rely on, that people who used to study, people who wanted to study those periods, they always relied on the account of the other people, the kingdom, the other kingdoms, the historians of other kingdoms who used to write about them. You know, this has been happening even from the Mahabharata and Ramayan times. Okay, whereby the kings who themselves, their court historians would, would write all the fancy things about their own uh, kingdom and their own ruler. But then, say for example, uh, let's, uh, let's for the sake of uh, understanding, let's say that the, someone in Bihar writes all great things about Bihar. But then people would understand whenever they wanted to study Bihar or, and wanted to understand the society of Bihar, they would be more keen to find out what was the impression of Bihar in the eyes of people of Madhya Pradesh. What did the people of West Bengal think about Bihar? What did the people of Nepal think about Bihar? What have they documented about Bihar? Not what the Biharis have documented about Bihar. Is it clear? That's exactly what I'm talking about. The when people wanted to study, like for example, Mongols, let's uh, let's again take the example of Mongols. Mongol, the Mongol historians, they have written all sorts of things. And uh, but when people want to really study about the Mongol times, they study the uh, the accounts of historians from Russia. They they study the account of historians uh, that the historians who have accounted the Mongol times and who were Chinese. You know, their contemporary civilizations, their contemporary kingdoms, what they had to say about it. And that was considered to be far more genuine and authentic than the people who were writing their own history. Because it was believed and understood that they would be trumpeting their own greatness all the time. So, uh, finding out about Maurya. So, how do we know about um, that? Yes, actually, Maurya's, because the Maurya's could have essentially written whatever they would have wished. But then, um, uh, Chandragupta Maurya is actually considered to be one of the great rulers, and Ashoka is actually considered to be one of the great, great rulers of India, because even the foreigners who visited those times, uh, in those times, even the foreigners who came from different lands, when they have written their accounts in India or when they, when they went back to their own motherlands, they have painted a much more genuine and an authentic picture about what the society of India was at that point in time. So how do we know about Mauryas? <coughs> uh, of course, there are modern sources. Historians have used a variety of sources to reconstruct the history of modern empire. These include archaeological finds, especially the sculpture. Also valuable are the contemporary works, such as the account of Megasthenes, a Greek ambassador to the court of Chandragupta Maurya, which survives in fragments. Another source that it is of, that is often used is Arthashastra, parts of which were probably composed by Kautilya or Chanakya, traditionally believed to be the minister of Chandragupta. But then, as uh, as I just said, that because he happened to be uh, uh, the, working in the court of Chandragupta Maurya, he could have written whatever he would have wished. But then, when we have to check its authenticity, how genuine uh, the, the accounts are, then we also take into uh, the accounts like be, uh, besides the Mauryas are mentioned in later Buddhist, Jain and Puranic literature as well as in Sanskrit literary works which definitely were documented by other people from other kingdoms. While these are useful, the inscriptions of Ashoka on, mar on rocks and pillars are often regarded as amongst the most valuable sources. So uh, Ashoka was the first ruler who inscribed his messages to the subjects and officials on stone surfaces, natural rocks, as well as polished pillars. He used the inscriptions to proclaim that he understood the Dhamma. This included respect towards elders, generosity towards Brahmins, and those who renounced worldly life, treating slaves and servants kindly, and respect for religions and traditions other than one's own. So, uh, 
Ashoka is essentially talking about the, uh, you know, what it ought to be, how the society should be. Now, he's not trumpeting that, you know, uh, you know, he, he had tons of gold and he had tons of rubies and diamonds and all of that. He's not talking about his prosperity and the prosperity of his people and those kind of things. No, Ashoka is considered to be a great ruler because, uh, you know, he, he had what he had, but then he wanted people to also be spiritually lifted people he wanted people to lead a good life he wanted his people to lead a decent life a civil life to be nice to each other and not just to be nice to each other when it comes came to humans but to be nice to animals everyone rich poor everyone around them so um, that is and uh, when we are talking about Ash ashoka's inscriptions that is essentially that ashoka uh, uh, there was no television uh, students at that point in time or your whatsapp groups and your radios so but the king wanted to be heard the king wanted his people to live to the higher standards and ideals of life so what he did was he uh, used inscriptions and pillars in and he erected them in different parts of his empire so that the people could keep going through them all the time whenever they pass they could see that yes these are the basic tenets of life that is what morality was that is how that is what ethical living is and ashoka wanted his people to live that ethical life we shall continue thank you